All right, everybody, welcome to the webinar. For those of you who have just joined on the line, uh, hopefully you are seeing the opening screen that says Optimizing Quality Management, and hopefully you're hearing my voice. My name is Cheryl Mueller, and I will be moderating the webinar. So thank you again for taking time out of your busy days to join us. A few housekeeping points to mention. All of our attendees are in listen-only mode, uh, so we will not be able to hear, uh, hear you or hear any background noise on your end of the line, but hopefully you're hearing my voice. And if you do have any issues with audio, the suggestion is to log out and log back in again, but hopefully you're hearing me. We will have an opportunity for audience participation by virtue of using the question box on the um, GoToWebinar control panel. Hopefully you're seeing the control panel on the right side of your screen, and there's an area for questions. We encourage you to type your questions in the question box, and throughout the webinar, we'll pause to uh, you know, get these questions directed to the appropriate panelists uh, to respond to your questions. And if we do run out of time at the end, uh, we'll make sure that we do a direct follow-up in case we run out of time. So without any further ado, let's go ahead and get started with, with the webinar. So our focus today is, uh, foc our, our content is really focused on current users of the Invisible Sentinel technology. So we will not be spending a lot of time you know, describing the technology because we believe that most of you on the call are very familiar with our technology. However, what we do want to focus on our insights into how uh, you can optimize your protocols using our technology and in, in your testing for beer spoilers. We want to give you the opportunity to share, here's some experiences from some industry leaders who have been using our technology and we're delighted to have a couple of experienced panelists on the call with us. And then hopefully we can uncover for you all some practical techniques that can help you in your own breweries to protect the quality of your beer with our on-site detection technology. So our presenters today, uh, Nick Siciliano, who is the CEO and co-founder of Invisible Sentinel, will do a brief introduction to get us started. But the meat of our presentation today will include Rick Blankmeyer from Stone Brewing and Zach Miller from Victory. And again, we're, we're thrilled to have the two of them join us, and hopefully you're going to get some uh, great insights from the two of them. Uh, again, Nick is going to give a brief overview of the technology uh, and talk a little bit about our suite of products, which we believe will be new to, to some of you. Rick is going to focus primarily on the quality control points where monitoring should be considered, some of the things they're doing in their, in their brewery, and comparing traditional micro-testing versus this rapid detection methodology, and then some factors regarding uh, testing at various uh, quality control points. And then Zach is gonna focus more around environmental testing, critical areas to test, where and how, uh, and then remediation steps in various situations. So uh, Zach shift, will shift to focus more on, on environmental testing. As I mentioned, though, if you do have questions at any point for either of the panelists, any of the panelists, please go ahead and type those in the question box. And as appropriate, we'll pause in the action to uh, direct those questions to the panelists to answer for all to, all to benefit from. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to pass the virtual microphone, if you will, to uh, Nick Siciliano, and I'll let him uh, be kick off the content. Thank you, Cheryl. Hi everybody, I'm Nick Siciliano. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Invisible Sentinel. I would like to thank each of you for your time and participation today. I would also like to thank you for your business. Um, it's a big deal for us to be working with each one of you. We take a lot of pride and responsibility in uh, providing you know, the diagnostic tools you guys use to make quality decisions at your breweries. We take that role very seriously. Uh, innovation and continuous improvement are very important to us. So your feedback today and the feedback that we get from you on a day-to-day -day basis uh, really drives, you know, those initiatives for us. So again, really appreciate your time. I uh, look forward to today's webinar. And uh, given that most of the attendees are existing users, we'll be brief on just giving a little bit of background on the company and the technology. I'll bring everybody up to speed on what we've done to date uh, with our beer portfolio of products. And then I'll turn it over to the real stars of today's webinar. Zach and Rick. So just a brief background. We co-founded Invisible Sentinel back in 2006. 
Uh, and the mission of the company or the vision was to provide a, an accessible and deployable molecular technology to give unprecedented speed and specificity uh, from a result standpoint. We wanted to be able to empower quality managers, brewers, winemakers, um, food safety personnel to make decisions as quickly as possible regarding the risks of spoilage or, or uh, presence of pathogens in their products. Against that vision, we developed Veriflow, which is the technology you use today. This is a platform technology uh, that delivers, as I mentioned, unprecedented speed, particularly for spoilage organism detection. You know, and in doing that, we really empowered quality managers to shift their, the management paradigm from one that is reactive to preventative. And that's the real power of the technology. And the core of the technology is on, on two tenets in microbial detection. One is you know, molecular principles and PCR, um, and the other is essentially antigen capture, which we allow for on the cassette. So by combining these two principles, we've been able to put together a very practical, deployable, um, easy to use molecular diagnostic that can be performed at the brewery on site, um, while at the same time being able to provide you speed, specificity, reduce sample handling, et cetera. So, you know, we've, we're very proud to have achieved that. We continue to improve on that platform and improve on the portfolio of products that we offer. So we launched our brewing portfolio in April 2015. And really the goal was to provide same shift results for the presence of spoilage bacteria. We initially focused our portfolio on Pediococcus and Lactobacillus, specifically beer spoiling Pediococcus and Lactobacillus that present the, or that possess the Hore and Horsi hops resistance genes to allow them to persist and in fact spoil beer. Uh, we're very proud in the short amount of time that we've been commercial to have earned the business of over 100 breweries in more than 15 countries. Uh, we've since expanded the scope of our product portfolio to address additional microbes that are of concern to brewers. Uh, we, we launched spoilage yeast products for Britannomyces bruxellensis specifically as well as pan wild yeast or decorous species. And most recently we launched tests for Megasphera and Pectinatus and as well as pan lactic acid producing microbes. And again, all of these tests are really born out of the feedback that we've got from brewers, um, the microbes of concern, how they're currently testing for them, and, and working to improve upon those testing methods. So we really do pride ourselves in listening to the industry, understanding your needs, and making sure you know, we provide value adding products. And you know, on that note, our industry partnership program is very unique. We, we launch products with industry partners. We develop them and launch them. Um, and that is what we did uh, to enter the beer industry with Victory. Uh, Victory was our development partner. We sat with them and discussed you know, what our vision was for a molecular diagnostic for use in the breweries, what the goals were with the specs, and our time with them during that development period really allowed us to understand the needs of brewers, some of the existing challenges, and gave us the opportunity to engineer around those. You know, since then, we've expanded that industry partnership program to include validation partners such as Stone and Rick and implementation partners to understand how our technology is being implemented at the brewery today and what we can do to improve upon um, the tools that we currently provide. As I mentioned, your feedback is invaluable to us. These industry partnerships give, give us an ongoing line of communication. Um, we take them all very seriously. We consider all of our customers partners. Um, but, you know, but on that note, we really appreciate Zach and Victory for uh, venturing or, or risking the uh, taking the initiative to join us on this venture to be able to provide breweries uh, products, quality management products, and of course uh, that partnership has been invaluable. It continues to this day, and he'll be on the line today to talk about how they've implemented the tool to date. And of course, Rick at Stone, another long-standing customer who we value and they'll be talking about how they implement the product at their brewery. You know, being able to hear it from, you know, world-class brewers and world-class breweries, you know, regarding how they use and implement the product, I think will be useful 
you know, for all of our existing customers. And again, very useful for us at the company as we continue to improve on the portfolio. So um, without further delay, I'll turn it back to Cheryl and uh, we'll get to the meat of our presentation today. Great. Thank you, Nick. So uh, next up is Rick Blankmeyer, uh, following on our uh, CEO address there from, from, uh, from Nick Siciliano. So Rick, I will let you uh, jump in and uh, start with an introduction to Stone Brewery. Great. Thanks. Appreciate it. So uh, definitely uh, appreciate everybody coming out to hear me yabber on about uh, quality stuff. I know uh, most people think this is really boring, but I know that uh, everyone that's here uh, who's online uh, appreciates and uh, definitely values quality in their breweries and other um, places of employment. So I definitely appreciate that. So um, anyways, uh, jumping right into it. My, I work at Stone. My name is Rick uh, Blankmeyer. I'm the quality manager at the Escondido location, Stone Brewing Company. We uh, just opened our East Coast facility and uh, it's starting to produce a lot of beer now um, for the last about two or three months now. Um, last year we made about 325,000 barrels. Um, we also have a facility in um, Berlin, uh, Germany, which is uh, producing a lot of beer now as well and cans for a lot of our European customers out there and it's just been a really warm perception for us. Um, you know, really our overarching uh, uh, business plan and uh, core value is to be amazing and uh, very essential in that process is um, having high quality beer going out and having amazing beer and if your beer is not as uh, high quality then uh, it definitely doesn't fit with our uh, core values so it's been it's been a great uh, experience and working here at Stone and uh, it's been great implementing the um, system that uh, uh, Nick and all of them have just spent a really long time and uh, has been really listening to our needs and it's been a great partnership so far. So going going right into it, if we go to the next slide. Um, we have a quick poll here um, for everybody. I think everybody should have a, uh, there you go, a little poll that pops up. Um, and which of the following points in the brewing process do you currently perform microbial testing? And so feel free to click on those. I'm, I can't vote because I'm going to be discussing it later on, but uh, let's see if Sarah has all the input for it. All right, it looks like oh, we're almost there. Almost everybody's voted. <laughs> uh, it, it's, it's the other one person I put to sleep with my voice, so I apologize <laughs> for that. All right, so 100% have voted. Here's the results. Great. Okay. So a lot of yeast handling and propagation and everybody in filtration bright tanks, um, which is great. That's great news. So if we go forward in the uh, the poll, kind of uh, spoiler alert, um, and uh, pun intended, uh, all of the uh, the quality that we've, uh, you know, the uh, different cr uh, critical control point and our quality control point testing we do is in all of those areas at Stone. So if we go forward a little bit. Especially with uh, using the uh, Brew Pal system and uh, the Brew uh, Brew Bruck system, so going into a quality control points, uh, and the big difference between quality control points and critical control points. So quality control points is what we um, have determined at Stone as being key areas of the process that, uh, from especially in, in, since we're talking about microbiological testing, would impact the flavor of the beer or the the, the shelf stability of the beer. So with all those, uh, we actually ended up um, putting on there for the quiz, yeast handling and propagation, uh, cold side additions, barrel aging, filtration, bright tanks, and packaging lines. These are huge uh, contributors, especially barrel aging and uh, bright tanks and packaging about where different um, organisms could get making themselves present in the beer and could express themselves. And that's different than critical control points, which is more from a food safety and HACCP standpoint. And so that's something that we really want to differentiate because uh, critical control points is more about the safety of the customers. Uh, quality control points is more about the safety of the beer and, re and the uh, um, uh, keeping a good reputation and uh, you know keeping your business in in uh, in, in, uh, in business essentially. So if we go forward one slide, so. 
I, something I really want everybody to kind of take from this is that while we use um, Invisible Sentinel system pretty, uh, you know, very uh, in bulk and then we use it in a lot of different places, we still do a lot of traditional micro. And uh, traditional micro, micro is great for determining general cleanliness of your whole entire process. And a lot of those places that I mentioned from propagation all the way to packaging is our key aspect, key area is to make sure that your process is clean and is free from contaminants. Whether it is, you know, benign bacteria, I, I put some uh, petri dishes on here, some different things we look at, bottom uh, pictures for our house yeast and the top pictures, some benign bacteria that sometimes we see in, in some parts of our process. But ultimately, you want a really clean process. And especially most of you uh, who are on the line right now who are in craft brewing, I'm guessing most of you don't pasteurize your beer. Even if you you did you want to keep a clean process so that's why we still keep a pretty robust traditional micro program in place but it is slow you know and, and we all know that you have to incubate it about five days you have to use uh, selective media for you know doing beer spoilers you might not catch them all or might be you know some medias might not you know uh, express or grow the colonies that you want it to and it might affect the beer itself so using the invisible sentinel system like brew pal to um, as a supplement is really great because you can um, there's ability to you know if you have a something that looks like maybe like an acid producing colony um, on one of your plates you can put that into the invisible sentinels like brew pal system and you can of course look at it under the microscope but it could not meet some of your qual you know uh, criteria from you know being catalase or oxidase positive or negative you know gram stains you know might tell you it's gram, gram positive or negative but that's it you know and it's nice to have something that's a uh, more of a genetic identification of what actually you're looking for. Um, brew map has been great too. Uh, we just uh, started using that to um, you know kind of a limited degree but it's been uh, fun to just make sure that whatever we're seeing is not exact is not a, uh, a megasphere of pectinatus which is you know kind of scary for us. Uh, I mean most beer spoilers are pretty scary for as big of a brewery as we are but uh, you know megasphere and pectinatus especially so. So going forward through the process um, to uh, yeast harvest and propagation, um, yeah, I, I know a lot of uh, breweries out there, you, you probably buy, you purchase your pitches, especially the smaller breweries, purchase your pitches through a yeast um, provider. But you know you still want to maybe harvest and capture some yeast, whether from cone to cone pitching, or from actually harvesting into a brink. But regardless of all that, it's really important to grab samples off of that propagation system or your um, brink in order to make sure that your yeast is healthy, not only from a viability and cell count standpoint, but also from a you know uh, contamination or mutation standpoint. So we still use a lot of traditional micro for that, but you know especially with how rapid that most breweries. Uh, use their um, yeast it's uh, you know you you, it, you capture yeast and then you pitch it you know probably within you know I'd say about 12 or 24 hours of harvesting it so uh, Invisible Sentinel has been nice especially from brew pal standpoint and uh, we actually use brew brux the uh, um, the, the Britannomyces brux analysis uh, identifier um, to uh, determined if we're we have a pure culture of yeast going through and that's been really key for us because if you have a little bit of spoiler in your yeast brink or your propagation like we do and you send that to three other tanks then you have three other infected tanks by that time and so uh, the speed of the uh, um, rapid detection has been great for us um, since time is critical with that um, and using the brew brux is uh, for the presence and absence of Brett you know we make the um, enjoy after Brett IPA and that's been something that we've been um, using the brew brux system for making sure that when we do clean our tanks that when we get the CIP water and we test for it that all of the you know if, if we get a, even a slight positive we'll just do another CIP on the tank um, you know and that's really important for us even if, if, when we do all the packaging and producing of that uh, beer in our off-site barrel aging facility, um, but even then we want to make sure we don't cross-contaminate Brett with some of our other spirit barrel aged uh, 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 brands. Um, next slide, please. Actually, um, Rick, there's a question. Oh, that we got in. a question? Yeah. Uh, let's see. At what point are you using BrewMap was the question. Uh, what point? Um, we use it... Um, mostly as kind of a spot check 
uh, in our system. So uh, after doing traditional micro, we get the plates back from incubation. We see something, um, you know, we, we examine the colonies and determine if, you know, any of them look like there might be acid producing or something that we haven't really seen before. And then we'll use the, the brew map to um, determine, you know, at least uh, uh, genetically if we're actually looking at uh, Megasphera pectinatus. And so that's where we're using it right now. We're looking at a lot of different places to use that, including our barrel aging um, uh, process, which is something I'll be going over in a little bit, but uh, that's mostly where we're using it now, but we're kind of planning on expanding it out. Um, so far, no hit, uh, no positive hits on it, which is great uh, for our process, but, you know, it's, it, I, I'm, you know, being in quality, you're always kind of a little bit paranoid, so it's always been nice to at least have that uh, peace of mind, so and that's a really good way of that uh, the brew map has been, uh, and I'm really glad that uh, Visible Sentinels developed that. All right, great. Well, I'll let you uh, keep moving here, and we may uh, come back to some other questions in a bit, but we have another one of our um, slick uh, polls here. Here it is. Yeah, so just kind of get a poll out there about who has a barrel aging program. I'm guessing most people do at this point. Great. Well, that's good news. So, um, you know, barrel aging, there obviously there's a lot of uh, ways that, uh, you know, beer spoilers and wild yeast can get into the process. So, um, we actually have a pretty significant barrel aging program here at Stone. And uh, a lot of our brands, um, notably uh, the uh, Bourbon Barrel Aged Arrogant Bastard, uh, Woot Stout, and there's a, a couple others out there that we actually mix uh, fresh and barrel aged beer. So, and then uh, run it on our big uh, bottling line. And so this has been a, a huge asset for us from using Brew Pal and Brew Buck, Brooks and also Brew Deck in order to determine um, if we can actually bring the barrel aged beer over and uh, feel very confident that it's not going to affect our uh, line microbially because uh, any sort of downtime even for doing extra um, you know we do extra CIPs anyways on our, uh, our packaging lines but um, after running these uh, barrel aged and fresh mixed uh, brands but for the most part we uh, we, we want to make sure we avoid any of that so what we end up doing is we rack all of our beer out of the barrel into tanks um, and then we'll transfer those tanks over into totes that we'll then transfer to the brewery from our barrel warehouse and um, before that gets on the truck though we'll do uh, run a quick uh, uh, brew lab uh, um, sorry brew map uh, brew uh, pal and brew Brooks uh, testing on all of our, um, you know, that tank of barrel aged beer. And uh, if any of it has any positives on it, then we won't bring it over, you know, which is, you know, unfortunate because then we'll have to lose all that beer. But if you're having a barrel aging program, you're going to have to, um, you know, make some sacrifices here and there. It's just part of the business uh, with uh, barrel aged beers. But it's really nice to know that we have a, you know, good peace of mind if it all, you know, test clear that we have a uh, good barrel age mix going over, we'll send that over to the uh, brewery for uh, uh, packaging. Um, and then again, a lot of these beers that you haven't barrel aged uh, for a long time, you know, you've been sitting on it for a long time, you know, they're high profile beers. Uh, any sort of infections of these beers definitely will, you know, it'll show up on Beer Advocate and Rate Beer pretty quickly. And so you want to make sure that you're confident going out to the, the the public that uh, you know for everything that you've done you you have a, a clean beer going out you know and you can also test individual barrels we do the barrel lot method where we you know uh, rack out a bunch of barrel lots into a tank and then test it there um, some breweries especially for sour production facilities use like a Solera type system where they'll have like a propagation going on like almost continual propagation of their sour beer and then they'll you know uh, rack out two-thirds of it and then rack back in fresh wort into it 
and that's a good way of actually testing if you have uh, brew uh, uh, brew pal and uh, determine make sure that you have the right mixture of things in there, or even um, brew map to make sure you don't have what you don't want in there, which is something that might be throwing off a lot of baby diaper. And then you can clear that out and then fill it back up again, and re you know re uh, uh, introduce cultures to it that will be you know have give you a lot better flavor. So. Um, and, uh, going on to the uh, next slide. Sorry, can I interrupt you again, Rick? I apologize. There was a Absolutely. question um, just to back up a little bit. Sorry, this one came through going back to the yeast monitoring um, about yeah, sure. implementing a yeast monitoring program at the brewery. Can you tell us a little bit about your routine testing of your yeast uh, samples? And can you talk about the difference between brew deck and brew brocks and when I should use those? Is that part of um, that your protocol? Yeah, great. That's a great question. Um, so uh, in terms of traditional micro, uh, for every yeast propagation that we do, uh, we primarily, you know, we throw that yeast on all of our selective media. So we use SDA, LMDA for kind of general cleanliness. Uh, we primarily use uh, WLD and WLN. WLD is good for seeing if there's any bacteria in it and anything that could be affected by the cyclohexamide that's in there to kill off the eukaryotes. Um, and then uh, with uh, uh, WLN, it's actually good for um, determining, make sure that all your colonies look the same. And then we, that's what we use to make sure that our um, propagations aren't uh, mutating as much. Um, from um, an invisible sentinel standpoint, we'll use BrewPal, and then Brew, uh, we're, we're starting to introduce BrewMap to it. But uh, the Brux and the deck uh, the, um, uh, kits, uh, we like to use Brux because um, at this point, and I think I, I, I'm sure that uh, Jermaine and Nick would be uh, um, confirm this, but we're probably the largest buyer of brew Brux right now. But uh, it's kind of we've done some validation and actually determined that through it actually uh, picks up like. Um, uh, 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 Britannomyces uh, clausini and also um, Dre Fontainen, uh, which has uh, been good for us. And so we, since we did a lot of work with our Enjoy After, we want to make sure that there's no Brux in there. And we also figured out that, you know, because of how um, attenuative uh, uh, Brett is, uh, it, we, we, we want to make sure that we have that. And, you know, and in, in the capability, especially with our propagations. And uh, since we uh, ferment, you know, pretty dry with our house yeast, but it could ferment a lot further if there is a presence of uh, Brett. And so that's re that's our reasoning why we pick Brett, you know, the Brux kit rather than the, the deck kit for a lot of things. But we're transitioning over to a lot of um, the, the, the brew deck as well for doing propagation uh, analysis and testing. All right, great. Why don't we let you uh, move on then? Yeah, um, and then Zach's going to be talking a lot about environmental testing and uh, the packaging line is probably like the, the biggest area for that. So I'll, I'll kind of go over a little bit of the packaging and everything, but I'll let Zach kind of discuss um, all the nitty gritty details about environmental testing using um, BrewPal and all the other Invisible Sentinel systems. But um, mo all of you said that you use um, the brew pal for your bright tanks and 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 I'm guessing th these are reasons are pretty familiar to you especially with how fast everybody's growing but rapid filling and emptying of bright tanks you're not always going to be able to get a CIP in there um, despite me trying to chain myself to a bright tank making sure that they can't um, you know get away from it uh, without doing a CIP on it first but you know it's a good no go no go um, right away especially within a shift and so we use that every day every single new beer that we um, filter into a bright tank we run uh, brew pal on just as a quick go no go and say hey that's good to go and then we'll also do traditional micro on it but it's just nice to have that peace of mind you know when we do send beer out there so obviously a good application for it and then packaging um, the package beer itself is really important um, but we actually do a lot of uh, water testing with it to make sure that um, our rinser and jetter um, we use uh, you know have uh, filters on them uh, sterile filters and UV uh, dis um, uh, uh, a disinfection so we want to make sure that that's working correctly so we'll test those uh, systems out as well and make sure that um, in terms of our process water we're you know clean from a beer spoiler standpoint All right, moving forward 
And then um, I'll quickly go over this, and I'm sure this is painfully obvious to a lot of people out there, especially in uh, quality assurance, but, you know, financial impacts. Um, quality assurance rather than quality control. The earlier you can catch something in the process in terms of a beer sputter or micro issue, the less financial impact, you know, impact it is on the, on the business, which is great. Um, I mean, from a, from a return on investment um, point of view, I mean, quality assurance is never a good ROI, but it's good for the business. And, you know, you ultimately you want to prevent beer dumps. And you also especially want to prevent recalls because uh, beer dumps, that's internal, that's quality control. Um, yeah, you waste all that beer. You try not to, you know, you try to avoid that where possible. But, you know, it's, uh, it's good to make sure you can, if there is an issue, you can dump or recall the beer internally rather than reaching out to your distributors to do that. And so catching your micro issues early process, like pre-dry hop, pre-packaging, you know, especially pre-dry hop, because then that's when you add all the, you know, those fun hops that are really expensive, and then you're going to lose all, all that as well. So, and reputation impacts, you know, infected brands equals no good. Um, and then, you know, questions of the quality of the brewery, you know, it's, it's a big thing. You know, I value my reputation and the reputation of Stone, so I, I love using this system because it gives me a peace of mind and saying, like, hey, this is... You know, this beer is looking good, and I will send that out. Or, hey, I think I got a, a hit on Brett in this barrel-aged beer. Do you want to send it out? And then at that point, it's a business decision. And, uh, you know, obviously I want to not send anything out that's even questionable, but, uh, you know, giving your higher-ups the data that they need in order to make an informed decision is the best thing possible. So it's good. And I think that might be it, except for questions. So I've, had, I've got a couple of good questions already. So um, go ahead and hit me up if you have uh, any other questions. Here is another one that came through. If you get a positive on a bright, do you retest? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, 100%. Um, it, 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 I do that with anything. Uh, if we got to hit traditional micro, we'll put a hold on it and then we'll retest it. Um, but it's nice to have the uh, ability to re do a retest within, you know, 16 hours rather than, you know, five days. So um, it's just a good practice is to uh, do, uh, uh, if you get a positive, even if it's like a little itty bitty positive, like if the, you know, the, the, the line above is a little bit faint, uh, just to do it again, just to see if it you know, comes out with the same process and, you know, make sure you double check your aseptic sampling techniques and your process of actually uh, doing the, uh, um, uh, the the thermocycling and everything to make sure that your, you know, your, your team or yourself are doing the correct process through there. Okay, and one more, um, going back to your barrel program, how often are you testing in your barrel program? Um, it, it's it, at least a couple of times, um, you know, for, for the most part, it's, uh, we usually do a fair amount of turnover, especially on our spirit barrel aged beers. Uh, we try not to leave our beer in there, um, more than six months. Um, sometimes it's as much as nine, but at nine, we're, you know, a little bit weary of it, of any of the results coming out of that. So, you know, the, the big thing is, is that w at least with the, using the system, we'll rack it out. Um, and right before we need to send it over, and it's either going to be send it over or dump it, depending on the, re the results out of the, um, the Invisible Sentinel system. And uh, But from like a, t a typical process, um, our small batch team and our barrel <clears throat> wranglers will grab us a couple of um, samples of... Uh, uh, barrels um, over the you know for doing alcohol analysis and also for microanalysis and we'll use that as well as an indicator. All right, um, boy, they're coming in fast and furious here. Here's another one. Uh, since it's a quick testing, do you use autoclave tools for each brew pal or brew brux test sampling? Uh, we do. Um, I mean, we have a, you know, a reasonably fast autoclave in our lab. I know a lot of smaller breweries don't have that uh, luxury, but uh, anything you can do to just make sure that y you don't doubt your system, your process, and your um, your handling and your um, your bench skills is a good thing. So even if you just have like a bucket full of, uh, you know, sanitizer or something like that with all your tools in it, you know, that's, that goes a long way. I just want to make sure that uh, there's no uh, ifs, ands, or buts, that if there is a positive there is a positive and you know we'll retest it just to make sure but for the most part I just I still want to doubt my technicians uh, technique and so we have a lot of SOPs in place for that 
All right, I got one more question, I think, and then we'll hold the rest uh, until um, the end if we have time. But one question came through. Have you found that traditional micro has agreed, uh, correlated with your brew pal measurements? Especially has brew pal worked while micro has not? Uh, yes, a uh, short answer. A uh, long answer is, is that this guy named Jermaine comes in, tries to sell me this thing, and I'm like, ah, oh, it sounds a little bit too good to be true. So we did a lot of validation. We got some spoilers from White Labs and from uh, Y Yeast and, you know, like Lacto and PDO and got some stuff that, you know, a bad barrel. We know that went, you know, it was infected, went bad uh, from our barrel warehouse. And we used the, um, when he came to demonstrate the system, we did a validation on it using those samples and uh, found that it, it worked out really well. And it, it definitely correlated to what we saw on our micro plates. And then the other thing, too, is that we, um, you know, over the period of time, too, seeing, you know, wild yeast hits and Brett hits in our barrel age program, we actually found that uh, uh, it lined up really well five days later once we pulled the plates and saw that, yep, there was a big, you know, lawn of Brett on there and it, it showed like a heavy positive on the, uh, um, uh, the you know, the line and also on the, uh, the cassette uh, reader as well. So, yeah, so we, we've done a couple of different validation processes for it. All right, great. That was fabulous, Rick. I appreciate the information. Also, you're um, on the fly here, response to questions. There were a few others that came through, one in particular related to, um, to a CIP question. I think we'll hold that and I'll ask Zach to respond to that. But uh, I think we'll, we'll give you a breather, Rick, and we're going to turn the, the uh, podium, if you will, over to Zach Miller. And again, we're, we're really pleased, Zach, that you could take some time with us to focus on environmental monitoring. So, Zach, are you ready? Yes, I am. Take it away. <laughs> All right. So uh, I'd like to echo what Rick said earlier about thanking everybody for uh, for taking the time out of their day to come on and um, talk a little bit about some alternative uses for uh, BrewPal and the Invisible Sentinel products. So a little bit about Victory. Um, we, too, are celebrating our 20th anniversary this year. Uh, opened in February of 1996, originally in Downingtown, Pennsylvania. Uh, last year, we did uh, just over 140,000 barrels of beer. This year, we're targeting to do just over about 160,000 barrels of beer uh, for 2016. Uh, we have 10 year-round beers and 15-plus seasonals, as well as uh, a bunch of different specialty brands that we're able to kick out at some of our uh, smaller locations. We do have three locations. Our primary production facility located in Parksburg. We have our original location in Downingtown, Pennsylvania. Uh, and our newest or our smallest location is just a small little gastro pub uh, or a little brew pub in uh, Kennett Square, Pennsylvania, just a seven barrel system there. Uh, we put a very strong emphasis on our yeast, so I'd like to echo what Rick said earlier about uh, yeast maintenance and making sure that uh, you know we keep that spoiler free. We do use 70 different yeast strains uh, that we store and manage on site. Uh, we have 35 different states that we currently distribute. We're looking to open up a few more as our production increases over the coming year. Uh, and we also do distribute to nine countries. Uh, so that all comes into play really with taking a proactive approach uh, to our quality assurance, uh, especially regarding micro. Um, we don't. We certainly don't want to be getting any hits back on our traditional micro while our beer is being uh, delivered to Sweden, uh, for example. So. Um, with a, with a large international distribution, it's very important that we have a good grip on our uh, micro quality assurance. So uh, another little quick poll coming up here. Um, and it has to do uh, with do you currently conduct routine environmental testing in your brewery? Just a quick yes or no. All right, I think we got everybody. All right, about 50-50, awesome. So for the 50% of you uh, who currently do testing, hopefully I can give you some different ideas on how to utilize it. Uh, and for the 50% who currently don't, hopefully I can convince you that it is very worthwhile. Um, and maybe you can start up your own program and I'd be more than happy to, ha more than happy to help with that. Uh, so the importance of environmental testing, 
really comes down to taking a proactive approach. Uh, traditional media and even Invisible Sentinel on liquid product, uh, whether it be packaged beer or beer in a bright tank, uh, is, it's a reactive step. If you do get a positive, you have to react to it. Uh, the environmental testing makes it a lot more proactive. You're able to take a situation and get out ahead of it uh, before you actually infect any liquid. So it's very important for CIP verification, uh, whether you're intentionally inoculating through sour beer production or if you have an accidental infection where you need to remediate. Using environmental testing in that capacity uh, proves to be very fruitful, um, especially when you are looking to make sure that you're not going to infect any beer down the line. And it's also very important when it comes to plant hygiene analysis. So you can set more regular schedules uh, for your brewers uh, with regard to cleaning and ID specific problem areas throughout the brewery um, that I'll touch on a little bit later. But as for now, we can go to the next slide. Uh, so some critical areas of testing that we do regularly here at Victory. Uh, first and foremost being the packaging line. It is the only place in our brewery where beer will be exposed openly uh, to the environment, albeit for a very brief period of time, uh, but it is exposed nonetheless. So we take a very hard look at our packaging line uh, from the conveyors to the actual fill tubes to the little star wheels. Uh, everything is important that we get uh, a test on that to make sure it's clean. The gas exchange lines between our bright tank uh, and our fermentation cellar are very important as well. If we do, if we are unfortunate enough to pick up something uh, in the bright tanks, we don't want to be pushing that back via CO2 through the gas exchange lines back into our fermentation cellar. That just exacerbates the problem and can make it uh, that much harder to deal with when it comes time to remediate. Also, uh, quote unquote, sanitary parts storage. You want to make sure that any uh, parts that you have sitting in uh, sanitizer are actually staying sanitary. Uh, you know, Quat or, or, or other iodophore does break down over time and becomes a lot less effective. Keeping an eye on that uh, and making sure that your sanitary parts actually are sanitary is a big, uh, big a, a key factor for us when it comes to environmental testing. Also, high foot track it. Uh, high foot traffic areas. And specifically what I mean by this is the malt loading area. Of course, lactobacillus uh, being the bug that we've dealt the most with here at Victory uh, does reside naturally on the husk and, and uh, of malt. So any malt dust will carry lactobacillus. We want to make sure that we're not dragging malt dust through our brewery, specifically into the, uh, into the cellar and especially on the packaging line. And then finally, as a, uh, a quality control check on our own quality assurance staff, it's a good idea to regularly test your laboratory surfaces. You have a ton of different samples. You can see in the bottom right picture there, that is what our lab setup looks like. Uh, you can see all those samples sitting there on the desk. We want to make sure that we're not cross-contaminating any, cross any of those samples uh, by regularly checking the cleanliness of our laboratory surfaces. So the environmental test protocol is actually very, very easy. Um, it doesn't involve much more work outside of what you're already doing as far as sample collection. It's just slightly different. Uh, you can get the environmental swabs, and what you're going to want to do is t uh, find your target area and hit a representative area with that sponge. You're obviously not going to be able to um, you know, swab the entire inside of a fermenter or the entire inside of a bright tank, but about a six inch by six inch square uh, is pretty representative. Uh, then you're going to immerse that sponge, that swab, in 60 milliliters of sterile water and squeeze that sponge for about 15 seconds to release the contents of the sponge into the water. And then you just proceed with brew pal as normally. So instead of pouring your 25 milliliters of beer, uh, into a sterile centrifuge tube. You're just going to pour 25 milliliters of that water uh, into a centrifuge tube and proceed with it as normal. Uh, so, you know, normal time to results uh, using bottled product, for instance, will be about three hours. This is no different, maybe about three hours and five minutes. So ultimately doesn't tag on too much time uh, to your normal BrewPal protocol. Proceed. 
proceed to the next slide. Actually, can we right. pause a second here? A couple questions came. Oh, in. sure. Um, yeah. So, uh, can, one of the questions, can you tell us a little bit about how you've used BrewPal to validate CIP processes? Uh, yes, absolutely. So, um, actually, I will get into that later into the presentation when I talk about sterile or uh, 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 sour beer production. Okay. But sour beer production is a big, a, a big key production point for us, or a key point for us. We recently started uh, doing sour beer production, and with that comes the intentional inoculation of Lactobacillus brevis, uh, a, a very powerful beer spoiler into our uh, fermentation vessels. So after, after the CIP we ran on there before our, sana, before our sanitizer was added, but after a caustic and acid cycle, we did get in there and swab for the presence of any beer spoiling bacteria, particularly the lactobacillus that we had put in there. Um, and luckily those results did come back negative but it's a good indicator that our CIPs are working, uh, especially since we knew for a fact that we had a large amount, a very large amount of uh, lactobacillus brevis inside those fermentation vessels. Okay, uh, great. Here's another one, I, and um, this actually came in a little earlier, so maybe okay. uh, we'll, we'll try it out here. Would Brewbrox detect something after CIP that an ATP luminometer would miss? Uh, likely not. Um, the, however, the ATP, um, you know, we're, we're not exactly sold on ATP technology because of whatever comes in naturally with your rinse water may contain bacteria. In fact, it likely does contain bacteria, which would show up on the ATP swab. Um, the ATP swab doesn't give as specific results as a Brubrux uh, environmental uh, test would do. You, the ATP swab may be picking up ATP from your enteric bacteria that comes in with the water, regular bacillus, whereas if you run a environmental test protocol with the Brewpal or the Brubrux, you're going to get very specific feedback as to whether or not uh, you killed the target organism as opposed to uh, whatever may be coming in with your water supply. Okay, and then this might actually be either a follow-up question or maybe this one came through before your last answer, but uh, it's connected. Does this environmental testing uh, replace ATP testing at your brewery? Uh, we do ATP testing for sure as a quick spot check, but like I said, when it really comes down to it, when you're looking for the specificity, uh, you're not going to get that with ATP swabbing. ATP swabbing will give you just in general, are there any living organisms on the surface that you're swabbing? While this, while the uh, environmental testing with, with Brewpal or Brewbrux gives you specific feedback as to whether or not, um, you know, there's any PDO, Lacto, uh, Britannomyces, or if you use the MAP, the Megasphere of Pectinatus. So, uh, it's a lot more specific than ATP testing. It doesn't completely replace it for us. We're not going to, uh, you know, necessarily run a BrewPal environmental swab um, if if it could easily be done just for a, for a CIP check. But uh, if the ATP testing can be done, but it really does, I would say, lack the specificity that the BrewPal environmental swab does provide, or the the, uh, the Veriflow. Uh, process does provide. All right, great. I think we'll uh, we'll hold off here and let you keep going, and we may have a few more for you at the end. But let's let's move on. Okay. <laughs> so a quick case study, uh, specifically regarding our packaging line. Uh, we have 24 hour a day, five day a week bottling operations, and we kick out roughly 200,000 bottles a day. So you know, do the math there. That equi that uh, that equates to roughly one million bottles a week. Uh, which will retail for over $1.5 million. So on our packaging line, we have about potential exposure of $1.5 million worth uh, plus, you know, maybe more than that, up to $2 million, depending on the beer we're doing, uh, of product being exposed uh, to the environment. Uh, so really, with, with those operations, we had minimal downtime for cleaning, which led to growth of bacteria and molds on the conveyor, 
and on the fill heads, uh, on our star wheels in there, on the plate that transfers the crown, and you can actually see uh, some of our environmental test results back uh, on these cassettes here in the lower left of the slide. Uh, the bottom one being actually what came back on our bottle conveyor. Uh, we had a PAL score of four there, uh, and the reader kicked back, uh, the cassette reader kicked back 105 cells per mil. That's not exactly precise given the fact that we uh, used an environmental swab and we're not actually measuring a liquid per mil, uh, but this is actually what came back, uh, indicating we did have a very high level of potential beer spoilers residing on our bottle conveyor. And the one above that is actually from the crown transfer plate, which is involved uh, in transferring the crown uh, from the hopper onto the actual bottle and making that crimp. And you can see that that came back with a PAL score of five and uh, a very high number of CFU per mil, 443 uh, CFU per mil. And mind you, that's swabbing a uh, about the same size area as we were on the bottle conveyor, indicating that we have a very big problem on that crown transfer plate. And that does sit right above uh, open beer. So with the minimal downtime for cleaning, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we did see these problems crop up. Uh, and the environmental swabbing discovered these beer, this beer spoiling bacteria. Uh, and like I said, ex uh, potentially exposing quite a bit of retail uh, beer to the uh, to this potential beer spoiler. So we did go through a remediation uh, where we basically shut down for a day and cleaned everything uh, you know, with a fine tooth comb, so to speak. And since that time, we've used environmental con uh, or environmental testing to continually uh, test these specific problem areas and eventually using that information, set regular, uh, sorry, set regular cleaning schedules in order to prevent further growth uh, of this potential beer spoiler. So as far as testing frequency is concerned, uh, we do do some spot testing, uh, and that's just point of infection analysis. If anything comes back as infected, we're going to be right on that with a spot check. Uh, and see if we can't identify where the infection took place based on that environmental testing. We're also going to do uh, CIP verification on intentional inoculations, so that would be sour or Brett beers, where we would spot test those fermenters or the Bright tanks uh, immediately after they've been emptied and CIP just to make sure that the CIP was effective. We also do some weekly testing and that would be on our bottling line, which uh, you know I keep harping on this point. It's a big uh, point of contention to make sure we keep that clean, as it is the only area that beer sees the environment. Also, laboratory surfaces, we do uh, a lot of testing over the course of a week. We want to make sure our lab surfaces are clean. And uh, specifically with regards to your breweries, uh, other critical areas where beer is open to the environment, you should do on a weekly basis. Make sure there's no buildup of potential beer spoilers. And then we do monthly checks as well, uh, which are just random vessel checks post CIP. Uh, so that would be any fermentation vessels, uh, any bright, bright beer tanks, uh, our water holding tanks, we do check regularly to make sure there's no buildup of any potential spoilers in there. Um, but uh, your less critical testing points uh, occur on a monthly basis, your more critical testing points on a weekly basis, and then your spot checks uh, for any intentional inoculations. So there's, of course, uh, potential financial uh, issues involved with the presence of organisms, the proliferation of organisms, and worst case scenario, persistence of these beer spoiling organisms. But if you just have the presence of organisms, what you're going to see from that uh, is some production delays and finished product holds. Um, production delays, whether that be downtime for cleaning, finished, per, per, finished product holds, whether that be a quarantine, uh, just uh, to confirm uh, that you do have beer spilling bacteria there. And what you're going to see financially as a, as a kickback from that would be labor inefficiencies from the cleaning. You know, anytime you're not packaging beer, your brewery's not making money. Uh, so that is a labor inefficiency. You're going to see a reduced throughput 
So instead of a million bottles a week, we may see 800,000, we may say 600,000 uh, bottles per week, which uh, is obviously also going to kick back some revenue delays, especially with regard to product quarantines. Uh, we've been in the situation where we have held beer before, uh, so we could confirm that it was spoiler free, and of course with that comes missing orders, uh, and therefore revenue delays. If the problem gets worse, uh, and you have actually proliferation of these organisms, what you can begin to see is cross-contamination between brands, and then you're really going to see a lot more of a widespread impact. Uh, where you may have to fork over some overtime uh, for extra cleaning. Uh, if you need to take care of any remediation, being that uh, sterile filtering, uh, those filter pads cost a lot of money. It costs money to run flash pasteurizers uh, and the cleaning costs involved with that, as well as any potential product loss uh, if you do have to dump any beer in-house uh, will, will be a very large financial impact on the brewery. And then worst case scenario, if these organisms persist and you're not able to effectively remediate them, that's where the financial impact really comes back uh, to bite you. And that's specifically with scrapped packaging. And once the beer's in the hands of the customers, the cost of a recall is uh, very damaging. So not only do you, do you uh, have the packaging loss, you also have the cost associated with the recall. Uh, and then finally, the damage to brand, which uh, Rick, Rick did jump on earlier. Uh, damage to brand uh, really calls into the question your ability as a brewer, and the customer certainly remembers that uh, and will remember that in the future. So it's very important to keep the financial impact uh, of potential beer recalls with regard to environmental testing. Environmental testing should identify this before we even enter uh, production delays or finished product holds, let alone uh, let it get to the point where we have to recall brands. It's a much more proactive approach than traditional micro-testing methods. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Zach. Uh, I'm, I'm sorting through a number of questions that have come through here for Zach. So um, are you ready, <laughs> Zach? Yeah. So, uh, yeah. One person asked, actually there are a couple questions related to, do you test with both BrewPal and BrewBrux every test? No. Uh, every time, no. Uh, if it is an intentionally inoculated Brett beer, then we will test with the Brux. But we have been lucky enough to not ever have a problem with cross-contamination in regard to Britannomyces. We have, however, had big issues with lactobacillus. So that is our primary uh, that is our primary concern, at least at Victory. So when we uh, do environmental testing, we're specifically looking mostly at BrewPal. Uh, we have used Brew Buck, Brew Brux, uh, but very infrequently, especially relative to our use of BrewPal. Okay. If you know, I I would say a caveat there: if you have problems with uh, brew, with uh, Brux at your particular brewery, then by all means, I think you should be using the Brux. But we we do not necessarily have those problems with wild yeast. Okay, uh, there's another question that came in. I'm going to ask you maybe to answer it first, Zach, and then maybe Rick, you could answer it as well. It has uh, relates to it. I want to test more. I'm paraphrasing a little bit here, but I need to justify the cost. Uh, maybe Zach, you guys, you and Rick could each comment on how you've justified um, the cost of additional testing. Yes, that's actually very easy for me to answer, and that is simple in that we got hit with a very large recall uh, regarding uh, one of our released, uh, one of beers which did make it into the market. It was very, very expensive, um, well over seven figures uh, when all was said and done, um, and that resulted very quickly in us looking at alternative methods, more proactive approaches to prevent that from ever happening again. So when it comes to the cost of failure, that is how we justified the use uh, or the cost uh, of preventing that potential failure. So I don't know if Rick has anything to add to that, but um, yeah, it was very easy for us at least, uh, especially when it came to that recall situation. Yeah, um, something very similar happened to us too. Um, not a huge recall like that, but definitely a scare and a uh, um, potential. And it basically, it 
impacted our production um, amount for our Woot Stout. Uh, since we do have the barrel-aged version of the Woot Stout that we blend with the fresh, and so um, we had a hit with one of the tanks and say, that basically said it was just full of lacto. And we, of course you can't put that into the bottle. So we had to dump that uh, barrel age portion. And so we couldn't, we actually cut back a lot on our, um, the amount of barrel age beer we could add to the Woot Stout, which, you know, was a, is a pretty high profile beer with our um, now not CEO, but he's our executive chairman now, Greg Cook. And so um, he's uh, definitely likes to, you know, make sure that we have meter volumes on that and so that really just like Zach said created the question like how can we more proactively look at and prevent some of these issues from happening and uh, that was what we actually determined was the barrel age and that's kind of where we started using it the most is our barrel age program and that's helped us save a lot of money there. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, I, I do want to acknowledge that we've technically hit the end of our time but if it, we have a few more questions that have come in so if Folks want to stay on the line um, for an extra five, maybe seven minutes here. I'll just keep firing questions at our panelists if that's okay. Um, so we did have someone ask, uh, how many tests per week do each of you guys run on BrewPal? And then, uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll send that to both of you. Both of you. Hmm. Let me do some quick math real quick. <laughs> <laughs> We do about 46 tests a week. Uh, that involves uh, not only our environmental testing, but also um, testing of, of, of beer, of liquid. So we do about 46 tests a week. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was actually doing quick math as well um, with that. Actually, uh, now uh, we're doing about 50 tests a week. Um, including all of our barrel aged beers that we put out, um, but more now with our bright tanks uh, for packaging release, we use the uh, uh, brew pal for that. So, and someone asked then, um, Zach, how many related to your numbers? How many people do you have working in your QA department? Uh, so we have. Well, let me do some math here as well. Uh, five people um, <laughs> working in our QA department but primarily only two of those are focused on micro. Um, so uh, really when it comes down to it, really have really two people focused on micro. Um, the others are analytical chemistry and sensory. So uh, yeah, about two, two people uh, focus on the micro. Okay. Yeah. Uh, at Stone we have, um, I have nine direct reports and all of them work in QA exclusively. Uh, we have uh, our microbiologist and then another um, technician that uh, kind of helps supplement uh, my, our microbiologist. And then we also have the other people focusing on sensory and analytical uh, chemistry as well. All right, great. Um, here's a question related to the brew uh, map, the Megasphere and Pectinatus uh, products. So I think that would be a question for you, Rick. It says, Megasphere and Pectinatus are strong anaerobes. Do you two prop samples for BrewMap? Does that make sense to you? Um, uh, a little bit. Um, yeah, I mean, the, so they're both strict anaerobes. And uh, what we end up doing a lot is um, just uh, basically are just making sure, at least from stone standpoint, we just make sure that uh, whatever we look at that it might look like uh, from all the different um, you know indications gram positive I believe and uh, or maybe gram negative um, I forgot now but basically we take a look at traditional micro and then we supplement using the um, invisible sentinel system and whatever pops up with uh, megasphere or pectinatus and we just kind of do go no go with it so um, we haven't seen it so far so um, we haven't really um, propped up a sample yet. I know we've seen it before in traditional micro, but we have never really kept samples of it on hand just to, because we wanted to get rid of it. And this is like back when we were, you know, in our old location too. So um, yeah, I don't. It's uh, we don't really propagate it or anything along those lines. We just we really don't want to have anything to do with it. And it's really hard to culture as well both of those organisms because they are strict anaerobes and uh, typical in incubation environment that most breweries use won't, is not ac adequate enough to actually propagate um, a, a significant amount of it. You might see a, um, a colony here and there of it, but uh, we just want to make double sure if there's any genetic um, residue lying around that uh, brew map can detect it. 
Okay, great. Um, there have been a couple questions that um, maybe there's a little lack of clarity about the use of brew Brux versus brew deck. Um, Nick, I'm not sure if you're still on the line. I'm here. Yeah, maybe you could just quickly again, I know you talked about it at the beginning of the program, but the, the two wild yeast tests, how they're different and where they might be used? Sure. The, the Brux test is specific for Bruxellensis. It also detects Clausen. Um, it does not detect the, detect the classical animala strains. One of the issues with Decora retinomyces strains is nomenclature. So they've actually recategorized some of the organisms. Uh, Decora looks for a highly conserved uh, genetic signature across all Decora species. The Brux kit looks for a very a more specific uh, DNA signature that's 100% conserved in Bruxellensis species and um, with Clausenii as well. Uh, but again, you kind of run into nomenclature issues, particularly when you look at Animala strains and Nardiensis strains. So really, the deck was designed to be a catch-all, focusing on a very highly conserved region um, across the entire family, and the Brux, you know, kind of more dialed in. Um, at a specific region that's highly conserved with within a few strains within that category. Okay, great. I think that that's a good synopsis. Um, I have one more question that's come in that I'm going to volley to you, Zach. In fact, um, it was personalized. Hey, Zach, <laughs> are you still okay? <laughs> are you still performing traditional micro along with Brew Pal and Brew Brux for all of your sample points? And if so, which media do you use? Yes, uh, I am uh, still doing traditional micro, uh, much in the same vein that Rick uh, said he is as well. Where, while the while the uh, the brew map, the brew pal, the brew brux are very specific uh, to those particular uh, organisms, we are also trying to keep an eye uh, on our bacteria that's introduced through the water, uh, less less of a concern when it comes to spoiling beer. You know, we're not necessarily concerned about a general bacillus or uh, enteric bacteria making it into the beer or uh, staff contaminations in the lab. Uh, so we do uh, regularly test traditional micro in conjunction uh, with the use of brew pal and brew brux. Um, and, and the reasons for that, like I said, would be what Rick touched on earlier and just keeping an eye on other methods of bacterial introduction into the brewery. All right, great. Oh, I didn't say the media we use. We use uh, SDA, LMDA, uh, as well as Pika Fast Orange B uh, as another quick growth medium uh, for any potential beer spoilers. Okay, great, great. And we use, and we use the same thing at Stone, actually, same media. Uh, okay, I, I think we're going to wrap up here because we've uh, we've run over our time ten minutes, and um, we we sincerely appreciate the the time that uh, both Zach and Rick uh, provided in you know preparing for this webinar and being um, such great partners as we've you know we as a company have advanced our own learning about the the needs of, of breweries. So thank you for your time, gentlemen, and also thank you to all our audience participants for joining us. You will receive a uh, one email follow-up from Invisible Sentinel with two very short questions to give us some feedback on the webinar because we're always trying to get better at doing this. So we appreciate your response to that. And then um, we will comb through all the questions that came through today. And if we missed any, uh, didn't get to answer them, we will definitely follow up directly with you folks um, with, to answer those other questions. So um, thanks again to our participants and, uh, and our panelists. So this will conclude the webinar. Thanks, everyone.